were one of the biggest sponsors of World Cup and Champions League, UCA in Europe, uh, NFL, NBA in the US, every sport you can imagine in the world, mm -hmm. PepsiCo is there. And we're talking about billions of consumers that engage with us, music events, music concerts. So what we are trying to do, and we have been trying to do, especially in the past uh, two years, is one, can we bring all of those together to one consumer data platform? Most of the time on Growth Masterminds, we're chatting with mobile app companies, mobile gaming companies, companies that have a mobile app and they're focused on it, or people who are in the mobile ecosystem, mobile ad tech, that sort of thing. Recently at Web Summit in Lisbon, I had the opportunity to meet with the Chief Strategy and Transformation Officer of Pepsi. Global position, massive company, multi, multi, multi billion dollar corporation with components and parts all over the world and a very complex business operation. I wanted to chat with her about, hey, how does Pepsi go about its business? How does mobile impact Pepsi? What are you doing with apps? And what I learned was astonishing. It was super interesting. It's multidimensional, uh, B2B, B2C, B2B2C, complex in many other ways. So we chatted about a lot of different things. It's going to be a different growth masterminds than most of the growth masterminds that you've been listening to, but I think you will enjoy it and get a very different perspective on not just mobile, but also business and strategy and how mobile impacts that at the most global level possible. Enjoy. This is Athena Kenyora, Chief Strategy and Transformation Officer, Pepsi. Hello and welcome. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Doing well. Doing well. I am excited as well. It's been a long time. It's been a year. That's yeah, not a long yeah. time. I guess it's sort of a long time. I want to talk about a lot of different things with you, including around strategy and transformation. Sure. You have strategy and transformation in your title. Why is that together? Yeah. And this is a first, as you know, we didn't have this function before since I joined the organization. Uh, and the whole intent was to be able to link the design of the key pri big priorities of the company and the, the key anchor programs that will drive both the grown, growth, high top line performance and bottom line performance with the execution. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, when Ramon asked me to join the corporation, we were, you know, brainstorming what would be the best way for us to accelerate mm -hmm. the transformation at the end of the company. And that's a broader transformation. And we've said, typically, you know, wh when you see who is the one that is thinking about the future is the strategy group. But then the strategy group drops the ball to the different groups and then it's like you go or to the just drops the ball. No, in you our case, that, right? <laughs> in our case, it, they don't drop the ball. They just then pass it to the rest of the groups, but then it beca doesn't become such a coordinated effort in terms of both the industrialization and the operationalization of the mm -hmm. capabilities. But when you have the groups together, the handoffs are seamless. So the design strategy leads transformation supports, execution transformation leads strategy supports. Mm -hmm. That was the first the reason why we brought them together. The second reason is the strategy profile of our PepsiCo employees is quite unique. So these are people that they haven't just come from all the consulting firms, the strategy consulting firms. They have had operational experience. They have been in the fields. They know the reality. So it's what I call more applied strategists. Mm -hmm. uh, so this way they understand that whatever they put together from them, thinking like Horizon 2, Horizon 3, has to land to the reality of how we run the business. And, and therefore, they have a transformational DNA. It's not just a theoretical strategy effort. So it also seemed very natural from a career perspective because we want our strategists to also then land to operational jobs, not stay in strategy forever, to have those groups together. Last thing is um, I'm also responsible as part of the transformation and to end for the digital transformation. Mm -hmm. So we said, this is a great opportunity for a strategy beyond category strategy, portfolio strategy, uh, geo strategy, to also uh, delve into digital strategy. Because then if digital strategy becomes part of the core strategy of the company, then everything you do from a portfolio transformation, from a geo expansion, from a category growth model, 
has the technology component embedded to that. So that was the last rationale in terms of the, bringing the groups together. Cool. Super interesting. Digital transformation is a key part of what you're talking about yes. there. Where does that hit the customer? Customer or consumer? I can touch How do they differ? I guess you have internal you. customers. Because we are a CPG company. Yeah? So as such customers for us are the big retailers, are the, is the corner shop, is the convenience, gas station, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. So I'll start with the customers and then I'll go to consumers. Cool. Right? And our customers are our partners. Let's start with that. We don't see the customer relationship with us as a competing relationship. So uh, with our digital transformation, what we want to do is be everywhere. I, in every single shop, you find a PepsiCo product, right? I distribution at scale. The second is to make sure that there is inventory on the ground at the time that consumers go and visit the store. Mm -hmm. So uh, with our customers, we have a common application, a B2B application that they can track the inventory, when our drivers will go and leave the product, uh, what should be when the merchandisers will go and put and place the product on the shelf at the right time, what exactly should be uh, the portfolio mix, say the planogram mm -hmm. on the store, everything is digitized. So everything from the logistics to the placement and the monitor of the inventory in the store and on the way to the store. And also with the, the application, what we are trying to do is then have tailored pricing and promotional strategy. So it's the strategy, the trade terms that we have, whether you're a small customer or big customer, range significantly and therefore we want also to allow for tailored promotions, rewards, gamification. So this is where the customer uh, component with us through the digital backbone mm. becomes very symbiotic. Mm -hmm. So that's one. Now, if we go to consumers, consumers um, interact with us in two ways. One is through e-com, through the digital commerce channels and that typically goes through e-grocery, aggregators, et cetera, but also more increasingly, especially since in the past two years, we have been doing a lot of consumer engagement and activations, and we are moving to a D2C loyalty rewards ecosystem directly with us, uh, whether they are through brand and marketing activations, big sports events mm -hmm. that we are doing, we're one of the biggest sponsors of so World Cup and Champions League, UCA in Europe. Uh, NFL, NBA in the U.S., every sport you can imagine in the world, mm -hmm. PepsiCo is there. Wow. And we're talking about billions of consumers that engage with us. Music events, music concert. So what we are trying to do, and we have been trying to do, especially in the past uh, two years, is one, can we bring all of those together to one consumer data platform? Right? So all first-party data will reside in this CDP. And on top of that, build loyalty reward, activation mechanisms, and a direct-to-consumer now platform that consumers can go there and have access to the full breadth of our portfolio. Um, so between our digital commerce, what we call EB2B, EB2B2C, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then now the D2C, consumers have all possible ways in an omni-channel environment to engage with us directly. It's interesting you mentioned the direct consumer piece because you're not eliminating your partnerships totally as not. you do that, but you are ensuring that there's a data relationship between you and your ultimate consumer. Absolutely. Not, I mean, well, data relationship has to translate to an incremental value for the consumer. So the way we see D2C is uh, about incrementality of the portfolio choices they have and more prolifer proliferation of the portfolio that we push to them. because. Mm -hmm. If you go to any uh, online provider, let's say Amazon as an example, right? Mm -hmm. You will find a select portfolio of PepsiCo, but you will not find every SKU of PepsiCo. Mm -hmm. If you go to a Walmart store or a Carrefour store, still you will find the core brands that you have, but not every brand of PepsiCo. Yeah. But if, if you go to our D2C or our B2B application, you will find the full breadth. And there are people that they are loyalists, right? They want a specific product, they want to have it, and they cannot find it in the store or the B2B. So one target group is how can you service those consumers that they want a specific experience with a subset of brands, but they want an expansive experience with those brands. Then you have another segment that they want to have choices. 
Like, no, I want my cooked oatmeal at this moment in time. And with the cooked oatmeal, I also want to get my um, live water experience. And within that, I also want to have my personalized bubble. For you to be able to do that, you need to have control of the portfolio, the innovation, the commercialization agenda, and also be, make sure that from a production supply chain, you are able to cater for this personalized experience. Mm -hmm. it, it's funny when you say that because obviously I know PepsiCo is a massive corporation with hundreds, maybe thousands of different products throughout. Thousands. But of course, yeah, thousands, thousands, there we go. But if you think Pepsi, when you think PepsiCo, and then you just mentioned bubbly. I didn't know bubbly was a PepsiCo product. That's quite interesting, actually. Yeah. Let's talk about mobile. And it's it's funny because I just I hit up the app store as I was prepping for this. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll search for Pepsi. How many apps will come up? How many apps does Pepsi have? Well, it, again, it differs per type of application, <laughs> exactly. right? We have internal applications and then we have consumer facing applications. So uh, we are talking about Definitely in the hundreds. Mm -hmm. So reality is if you count the active applications that they have mass uses in the organization, probably there are 600 applications. Uh, some of them are much, I mean, uh, Jen, for example, is our HR lead. So there are specific applications for our HR professionals. Mm -hmm. Everything from how you um, do compensation, how do you monitor the talent acquisition journey, how you do hire to retire. So the whole employee experience. I mean, there are specific applications for a subset of our employees like HR, right? Mm -hmm. um, so functional applications by nature. Then you have applications that are frontline. So our salespeople, our supply chain people, our drivers are using for the daily operations to drive operational excellence. I, our driver, because we have the second biggest fleet after UPS in the world, just to give you some idea. Uh, so our drivers have an application on the truck, well, I think trucks are the best go trucks, to monitor uh, the route, to drive route optimization, to within that they have predictive asset maintenance, so to make sure that nothing is happening on the truck, on the way for safety. Uh, <clears throat> these details, this application is linked to our fleet engineering group. Mm -hmm. So any data that goes from the truck, it goes back to the control tower we have in our fleet engineering center to track for every vehicle that we have, should we have a next service because they see some potentially a part acceleration in terms of the safety, et cetera. So just to give you an example, so we have a, always when we have a frontline application, there's a backend application as well mm -hmm. for the people that monitor the performance sure. of the capability. Then we have applications that we link with through APIs with our customers. Mm -hmm. So, um, Walmart is a very good example. Um, uh, when it comes to digital ordering between us and them, to make sure fulfillment is happening seamlessly and therefore you have a superior customer experience, we link our supply chain forecasts with their demand signals by linking the two applications together. So in the very busy days, uh, which start typically the weekends and the Mondays, potentially uh, depending on the location, holidays, holidays etc., you don't want to have stock ups. You want to have the inventory in time for the consumer to come. So making sure that the demand signal comes in time and therefore the whole machine of PepsiCo in terms of our operations goes to the store at the right time to fulfill that product is super critical. So that's another set of applications that we build. And then I would say the, the other set of applications is what we just discussed on the consumer side. Mm -hmm. Where this is where the applications that you see, we are in exactly the, in the middle of upgrading them because we are doing the global CDP rollout and the consumer data platform. We are revamping and redesigning the loyalty rewards. So the first holistic direct to consumer application that are being activated as we speak is mm -hmm. Joy in uh, Mexico and that goes to Brazil. We have uh, what we call Casan de Rio in uh, Turkey. And that is also going to be in the UK and North America is being activated in the middle of 2024. So that is a, a connected global D2C ecosystem. So you will see much more cohesiveness when it comes to the D2C application and more commonalities in the UI, UX and service experience, etc. 
Now, if you go to a different market, they will have a different B2C application. Mm -hmm. We're trying to standardize that component and link it with the WMS systems, inventory management system for fulfillment purposes. Mm -hmm. Super interesting, super complex. I can't imagine how many moving components and pieces there are in this whole thing. And you've obviously got multi-year plans that you're building as a global corporation to bring different markets online. Ultimately, why do you want your app in the hands of a PepsiCo consumer? One is uh, convenience. Uh, the PepsiCo consumer wants to have a choice. They have been telling us. They want to have the ability to engage with us directly, not through an aggregator or mm -hmm. through a third party. And part of it is because it, sometimes they just want to be aware of all the portfolio choices. To your point, right? Some of our consumers know, even our loyal consumers, hardcore Mountain Dew fans, right? And they don't drink anything but Mountain Dew. Yeah. Okay, but they could be chips. I did. <laughs> Doritos. So it's one of the great opportunities to educate, but also do cross-sell up selling mm -hmm. through that process. The second is um, uh, our intent through D2C is also to have what we call immersive experiences. So depending on the cohort, we have um, consumers who are very into gaming. Mm -hmm. Some of them are uh, huge music fans. Some of them are huge sports fans. And because we are, in terms of sponsorship and engagement, as PepsiCo, we are so big in those spaces, we want to ensure that they benefit directly from all the loyalty and rewards that comes with the direct-to-consumer platform. It's very hard for you to do it through a third-party platform mm -hmm. or through a B2B ecosystem because you will never pass the full benefit to the consumer. Mm -hmm. There's always going to be an intermediary. Mm -hmm. That intermediary expects to make profit. Yes. So the, the, the pass-through of the gaming is always going to be diluted. We don't want to dilute the benefit. We want the consumer to take the full benefit mm -hmm. of the offering. So I would say these are the two biggest parameters, convenience, portfolio choices, and full benefit of the full experience of PepsiCo, including, of course, merchandise. And um, you would be surprised how many people are saying, oh, can I have my own personalized sweater of Cheetos? <laughs> oh, you would be shocked. As a European going to the U.S., <laughs> it's like, oh, wow. It's a love relationship. It's an adoration relationship with PepsiCo, especially in the U.S. Excellent. I want to talk a little bit about you and I want to talk a little bit about your background and what you're bringing into this very complex reality because you have an interesting background. I call I, it's an eclectic background. You've got analytics, uh, big data. Um, you've got sales experience, which is unusual given some of the other things that you've done, but is also interesting and a ton of AI experience. Yeah. Where does AI hit your strategy for PepsiCo? Uh, first, firstly, as part of my role, I also have the AI groups under me. So uh, in the team, it's also digital and data analytics and AI. And now, actually, um, last week we announced that I'm also getting all the technology groups. Oh, you're just so greedy. You must have everything. <laughs> of course. It's an opportunity for simplification and even a, a bigger acceleration of the transformation agenda. So if you think before, kind of my role was unique, now it's going to be even more unique. Uh, but back to your question about AI. Um, Traditional AI, we have been embedding from day one. Mm -hmm. What we would call predictive AI in terms of the capabilities, think ML, and ML ops as part of the design. And even more traditional analytics, so econometrics and applied stats. All mm -hmm. of those have been the core part of the building of the capabilities because you cannot do guided selling if you don't have a recommender systems mm -hmm. to support it. And you cannot do predictive asset maintenance if you don't have optimization and ML ops routines to be able to support. Then AI, as you can imagine, came much later into the process. Sure. Uh, you know, last year is when the whole kind of industry exploded. Um, and uh, we have been experimenting. We have created an internal infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, of course, we Microsoft is our cloud provider, so they have helped us establish kind of internal infrastructure. Uh, but we do believe in um, eclectic use of Gen AI. Now, what do I mean by that? If you were to see kind of the breadth of the problems that a CPG company will have, I would say probably 
70% can be solved with traditional AI. Mm -hmm. You don't need Gen AI, right, to, yes. to solve it. Uh, Gen AI comes into the mix if you have huge call centers and mm -hmm. you want to optimize Sorry. customer service operations. So, or you need to make personalized Cheetos correct. sweatshirt. Correct. With... Correct. You know, totally. Yeah. So that's why, I mean, I brought this up. We have three areas we are testing as we speak. We, one is on creative and marketing. So I think there is an announcement. I'm looking at my comms, but Mirinda, yeah, okay. uh, it's out already, yeah. right? Where we have been using Gen AI to create if more personalized creative and mm -hmm. content design and campaign through Gen AI. And Mirinda, Which you can do when you have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with somebody totally. because you know them, understand them and have exactly. permission. Exactly, exactly. And we can share more around the Mirinda campaign. And actually we do Mirinda, which was interesting. We do it more in Asia first, India, Pakistan, et cetera. And it's coming to the rest because there it's like very big and, and consumers want it to engage very differently. Uh, we use Gen AI in uh, software that secops uh, technology. Mm -hmm. I think because we believe our software engineers can be much more effective in writing software and further developing and refining software. We use Gen AI in customer service operations because for many of those B2B and B2C applications, there's a call center on the back and their customer service, whether it's internal or external, doesn't matter. How do you ensure that you talk to the agent when you absolutely need to talk? Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you know, mm -hmm. there are the prompts, there are chatbots that they can direct you through the process. And eventually, if you don't resolve the issue, then you can go to a live agent. Um, so these are the three big areas <clears throat> that we are, I would say, testing. Mm -hmm. right? And depending on the success, we'll see how much we can scale further than AI. I wonder if, because as you said, you're everywhere in terms of promotion, in turn, also huge stars, um, celebrities and other things like that. I saw a company in China that used generative AI and a relationship with a celebrity oh. to send personalized messages from that celebrity, quote unquote, right? An avatar of that Another. celebrity looks to the naked eye, to the naked ear as that person. Hello, Jennifer. Good to see you're in today. You know, personalized mes message from that celebrity. I, I can assume Pepsi would do something like that in the future. Yeah, of course, we are looking at all the scenarios, right? With all our, uh, you know, with social influencers, we have big celebrities that we partner. Um, I'll tell you the one thing that we are very thoughtful, as you have seen, uh, in the broader industry, there are a lot of discussions around IP, around personal data, about the usual voice or avatars mm -hmm. of celebrities. So we need to do it in a way that falls within what we call a responsible business framework. And under that, we have a responsible AI framework, which means is one, it cannot hint any IP that is mm -hmm. third party's IP, right? Second is... Um, who has liability if something happens? Yeah. So liability laws that come with that, even beyond IP and copyrights, right? right? It's something that we, with our legal department, we are trying to ensure that the company is protected and more importantly, our consumers are protected, right? Um, because you don't want consumers to feel this is intrusive. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And the third one is the traceability, which is also quite important. So. The process that, whether it's Gen AI or traditional AI, we, it's the process is the same. It's just the mechanics are slightly different. We have a um, data ops environment. So we trace the data from the source to the usage, inside the mining component. We have an ML ops, which ensures that from an algorithmic bias, um, our models are uh, reasonably traced. And at the same time, we don't in introduce any bias around gender or mm. sex or uh, minority. So, all the components that you wouldn't want the models to drive a specific outcome. And then is on AI targeting mm -hmm. as well. So if you were to break down those elements of the responsible AI framework, whether it's a Gen AI model or a traditional AI model, we're trying to follow the same process. The complexity with Gen AI is what is the baseline model that you use or what is the prompt? Mm -hmm engineering and how this has been created and whether you are just defining the prompts or you are creating the prompts. Yeah. So this is where the tricky part comes into the mix because the LLMs are deploying the prompts. So whoever designs the prompts actually is the one that introduces the bias. So what we want to ensure is that the prompts 
the specs of the prompts are given by us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The baseline uh, usage of the LLMs can be given by um, AI, Microsoft, or any other, you know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, company, whether it's Google or AWS. It's fine. But then we further refine the LLMs to ensure of the traceability. So PepsiCo plays in the beginning a component in the middle of the process and definitely in the end mm -hmm. of the process. Mm -hmm. So this is how the responsible AI then ensures responsible usage of that of those models. It's really interesting because ChatGPT, OpenAI just released GPTs where you can literally train your own version of GPT with Correct. some corpus of your own writing or your own yeah. knowledge or, or somebody else's or something yeah. like that. I assume brands will eventually do something like that and create an AI that is the Pepsi AI or the Pepsi yeah. LLM and respond in brand voice and stuff like that. Something for the future? Yeah, of course. Uh, we look at all the scenarios. Let's start with that. I mean, uh, our strategy is, uh, you know, we have to be open to be able to test things, but we have to do it in a way, one, as I said, responsibly, so yeah. I will park that. The second element, which is super important thing and sometimes that we forget, this is a very costly investment. Yes. So if you were to fully train the model, that costs like 100 times more than a traditional AI model. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you can spend all your budget just training models <laughs> I, and not industrializing. And then you need a lot of GPUs exactly. to answer all the queries. And then you have a lot of <laughs> GPUs, so which means that both from a hardware and a software perspective, over and above what you need to pay to the Microsofts of those worlds, I mean, that is all your technology budget. You have to drink a lot of Pepsi <laughs> to pay for that. <laughs> I hope our consumers keep on drinking a lot of Pepsi in respect of the thinking of the model. Pepsi Zero, preferably. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, I think this is where whomever leads this transformation needs to be very apprehensive of the broader implications. Mm -hmm. So uh, when those models also become very cost efficient, it will unleash for the corporations big use. It's now, if you were to think about it, it's a privilege of the big company. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I can afford to use them. Uh, my small competitor cannot afford to use them. So what do they do? They will go open AI, open AI, meaning the company, yep. open AI ecosystem. This is where the danger comes with IP and liabilities, et cetera. So there is a big danger of this becoming the wild west if it doesn't become one is at least slightly regulated with the framework and number two, more cost efficient. Mm -hmm. Excellent. It's been really interesting chat. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. If you need anything else, just let us know. I'm happy to answer.